Uh, to reduce any kind of uh, distracting noise in the background, we ask that you keep your computers on mute. Um, you don't have to have your camera feed on, that is optional, um, but we do love to see your faces. And if you do have your camera on and you'd like to um, ask a question, you can raise your hand or wave and then unmute yourself once the uh, presenter acknowledges you. Um, otherwise, you can um, hold questions till the end of the session. Um, it is now two o'clock, so we'll go ahead and begin, and we'll start with Dr. Nilka Aviles. Good afternoon. I trust everyone is actually taking care of themselves and their families during this pandemic that is impacting us in one or another way or other ways. Uh, and I'm sure that we are all looking forward to regaining our normal lives again, hopefully in the near future. My name is Dr. Nilka Aviles. I am Idra's Senior Education Associate at IDRA. And I'm also the co-director of the Department of Education, Innovation and Research grant titled Re-Energizing Leadership to Achieve Greater Student Success. So this webinar is going to help educators guide students into selecting one of the topics from the journal entries into another genre, that of a letter. So journaling will evolve into letter writing. So let's begin. Okay, let's begin by looking at the agenda. Um, this slide pre uh, pre presents a brief summary of the different topics we're going to cover today looking at letter writing, giving students the opportunity to have their voices heard. As with the other webinars in our series, we'll begin by giving you the opportunity to write for a few minutes on a topic relevant to all of us. We will mention some reasons affecting letter writing and then take you from students' journal writing into a letter. Just as a reminder to you, we'll review characteristics of a letter and look at its components. Knowledge and still skill statements in strand six of our Texas uh, TEKS uh, address letter writing. So we'll bring those up and at the same time discuss the writing process. There are many wonderful mentor texts out there and we'll share those reading connections with you. We would like the student's letter writing to emerge from one of their journal entries and we'll suggest what some of those topics might be. Finally, we'll review teacher expectations and different ways for the letter to go public. Lastly, we'll present some professional resources. Of course, we'll end with a question and answer session and give you the opportunity to offer your thoughts. Please hold your questions until the end of our presentation. We'll be sure to get to them. Okay. And let me introduce uh, our, our presenters. Uh, I failed to do that. We have with us uh, Mr. Gerald Sharp, a uh, longtime uh, teacher uh, of ELAR, Language Arts. Uh, and we have Ginny Cantu as well with us, again, a uh, longtime teacher, and both of them have been uh, Abidos trainers. So they have a wealth of expertise, and that's why they're here sharing with all of us. Take it over. Okay, Gerald. Yes, next slide. What I want to do is talk about this prompt before we get into writing to show, as Ginny had mentioned, the evolution of moving from uh, a journal writing entry and this is our third out of a three series and we're looking at letter writing. Uh, the very first prompt we had was write a personal response about COVID-19 virus and you. So that could have been seen as a journal entry. Length was not an issue then the second of our three-part series was yesterday. We were moving from a journal writing into a personal narrative composition. That prompt changed by adding one minute to the time element. And we said, write about how your everyday routines have changed because of the coronavirus. So the prompt itself was expecting listeners, writers, and students, as we model, that they're going to be expanding beyond just a thought or an emotion or a personal bit of writing. And they're going to talk about 
how things have changed in their lives. So for today's, our third in our series of three, we are more prescriptive and we say begin a letter to a political figure registering a concern having to do with a coronavirus policy. And this, we have these kind of policies all over the country. So it's not one that's going to be only for a certain area. So we've got a timer. And if Michelle can start us on the timer, I'm going to start writing with you. run out of time. With this, uh, I've gotten almost half a page of writing, and it could have been spurred on by the headlines in today's San Antonio Express News and the editorial in the same paper. So what I was writing was to our governor, dear Greg Abbott. I understand your desire to restart the state economy that's been disrupted by the coronavirus pandemic. I am, however, concerned with the speed with which you have reopened movie theaters, restaurants, and shopping malls. Social distancing and wearing protective face coverings are important while the virus is still active in our communities. And then the little pirate stopped his jig. So that's how much I had written. Jeannie, could you share yours? I certainly, and interestingly enough, I wrote to the governor too. <laughs> you got <there>. And <laughs> the, the same about half a page. <laughs> Dear Governor Abbott, are you thinking 
coronavirus cases and deaths are still rising and you're opening the state, albeit partially. Yes, the economy is suffering, but so are those stricken with this affliction. Our major concern right now should be about decreasing the COVID-19 population. Locally, many restaurants indicated a hesitancy to open, even with a 25% occupancy. And that's as far as I got. That's a good start. So we have expressed, Jeannie and I, that feeling that speed in opening may cause a problem with public health. So we're looking at, we are not having just a journal entry. We're not having a beginning organization for a personal narrative in a composition that we're looking at expressing concern to a political figure on some form of the policies that are involved. So those come from all who have experienced the disruptions, the out of the ordinary occurrences, and putting on a face mask to go buy groceries. <laughs> so when we look at invitation to write, this is going to be something that could be worked in through our presentation to a full letter. Okay, can we have the next slide, please? When we propose that we're going to have letter writing, we realize that may sound strange to many people, especially those from millennials, Gen X, etc., or even students in our public schools. When we see about letter writing, it takes us, those of us who remember writing letters quite well, back to an earlier day and a different technology. It would be as if we were comparing the difference between a typewriter and a laptop. So we've got here some changing attitudes that do affect how often we write letters. So it's more than just the technology we use to create the letter, but we're also finding that many younger people in society like to have things done faster. They think that's more efficient. So with my sons as examples, both now in their 30s, if I wish to talk to them and try to call them on the phone, I probably won't reach them. But if I send them a text message, <laughs> they'll respond immediately, even the one in Birmingham, England. So that for them is speed and efficiency. And then we look at the popularity of emails. I get dozens and dozens daily. And it takes some time to sort through and take out all of the solicitations that have arrived at my laptop and those that want me to give to charities and this very important political movement. And I don't really get real letters that often on emails. There are often announcements. Mm -hmm. There's something with the speed there that can get to you. But that old fashioned, which I realize definitely ages me, habit of where if you wanted to send your thoughts, you would write it on a piece of paper, fold it up, put it in an envelope, put a stamp and an address on it, and it would take you quite a while to get a reply. So when we're looking at this faster, more efficient communication, we still find that when a pandemic happens, that there's sometimes a need for sending a concern to a political leader. So we are looking at letter writing. We are looking at going beyond just a thank you for what has happened. And we're trying to communicate our feelings and suggestions for the future. 
So these changing attitudes have definitely dealt a blow to letter writing. Dr. Joyce Armstrong Carroll and Eddie Wilson in their books, Acts of Teaching How to Teach Writing, have noted in the third edition that letter writing is not what it used to be. And in a part that sounds like it came from Joyce herself, she says, letters can be the writer's personal connection to an impersonal world. So when we think of that, we can still say, yes, I believe there is a reason for us to be communicating in a written form. Okay, the next slide, please. On this slide, we look at um, some uh, maybe purposes, ideas for, for going from a journal, taking a journal idea into a letter. As we mentioned earlier, we in our first webinar, we gave students the opportunity to write a journal entry about what's going on in their lives in this, in this uncertain time. And we know that students are experiencing in fact, teachers as well as students are experiencing a variety of emotions, anxiety, fear, confusion, depression, loneliness maybe, sadness, boredom. We ask them to explain what they were experiencing and reflecting and reflect on that experience. Our, like Gerald had mentioned, in our second webinar, they took their journal idea into a personal narrative, again explaining what they're experiencing and explaining its significance and impact on their lives. In this, our third webinar, we're asking students to retrieve one of their journal entries and turn it into a different genre. That is, to develop a letter based on one of their issues. It could be a letter thanking a public figure for their role in serving the community during the pandemic. It could be a, an opinion about some part of the coronavirus policy. Or it could be a complaint as, as, uh, about how they were personally treated during this coronavirus time. For example, wearing a mask, uh, grocery shopping, uh, parks closed, church services canceled, etc. Gerald's going to talk about the last bullets. Okay, and you're going to see some of the wording that we've mentioned on this as far as going from journal ideas into a letter that we're using certain terms that come about in our Texas teaks what is to be taught so thank you there is mentioned earlier and then registering a complaint about treatment uh, that is in the more mature grades but it's not expected of the lowest grades, but seeking information in order to recommend future possible changes. So they, the state of Texas expects that students can write a letter that would then be asking for information. So it doesn't have to be a complaint. And then the one above it talking about those suggestions of public policy. And that was how, as adults, we saw with the reopening of economy that there are some concerns that people have. I didn't criticize the governor politically. I'm looking at what it could affect as far as a public health issue. And then responding to a particular ordinance or order. So we still have those around. The governor says, you don't have to stay at home. Our city says, yes, you should. <laughs> so someone may want to write to a political leader saying, why do we have two different messages in the same state? And the last one there is talking about restrictions of personal movement. And that's brought in some of the protests in the country, people who resent being told to stay home. 
But when we look at our students in schools, their schools have been closed, their learning is online, and as Jeannie says, that really messes with their version of reality. <laughs> and so they may have some responses that they may want to share with others. And as Jeannie has also said, if they are keeping a journal, which we suggested from webinar one, they can go back, read an earlier entry, get an idea, and then write about it. So going from a journal entry or a journal idea is something that's very natural in a writing process. You started with an idea, but you haven't developed it. And when you take it into a letter, there are certain characteristics and certain forms that you do follow. So this is how we move from a journal through a composition of personal narrative and into a letter to a public official. Next slide, please. So we see the characteristics of a letter. And Gerald just mentioned that there is a, a form that a letter takes. So form is good. We're not asking for formula though. It's form, not formula, okay? <laughs> the form, a, a, as we know, a letter has an introduction, a body, and a closing. And in a few minutes, Gerald is gonna talk more specifically about those. But we've got, those are the basic uh, components of a letter. Um, we need to keep focus. Students need to keep focus on what they're writing. They need to be precise in their reaction to the issue and, and straight to the point, okay? Not, not kind of being flim flam about it, but just address the, the issue uh, head on. Um, they need to provide reasons why the letter is being written and give evidence that they've thought about it, they've given it considerable thought, and maybe a little research. And we can see all kinds of statistics, both on the TV and in the newspaper right now, talking about coronavirus cases and deaths locally, across the state, across the nation. So oftentimes those statistics will provide good evidence and support for the issue that the student is writing about. When we're looking at characteristics of the letter, these are something that the letter writer needs to know before starting the letter. And we know as teachers of young writers, if they get a chance to write to someone who can respond, that certainly then adds to the importance of this particular type of writing by the fact that there's an authentic opportunity. It's real life. These things happen. And political figures get thousands of letters a year. They may have a form letter that they send back thanking for opinions mentioned and whatever, but there is an audience there that will look at it, read it, who knows what they may do beyond that. But this gives the student writer that sense of, I'm getting an audience that's gonna be listening to what I have to say. The next one is when you're writing that letter, you are addressing a particular person. So definitely your audience is there from the beginning. And you don't say, Greg, it's good to write to you again. No, you're addressing the governor of a state. And so that last item there says we use what's generally a more formal voice. Dear Governor Abbott, and when I read it, I did say Greg, because it starts with G just like governor. So my mind said, yeah, he's Greg Abbott. Uh, I did not address the letter to Greg, okay? But when our students are the writers and they're looking at this, 
all of this we've performed on here with characteristics is a teachable moment for the student learner. Jeannie, anything else on characteristics? Okay. The next part, we're looking at components of a letter. Jeannie mentioned in characteristics, the very first thing that can identify you've written a letter and not a composition is you're going to have certain bits of information. And as she said, and what I would then recommend that students understand when we're looking at the form of writing, that students can often discriminate and sense there are some similarities. We have an introduction. It's gonna say the date the letter was written. It's gonna say the address you're sending it to. The salutation, dear, so-and-so, whatever your public official's name is, but for mine, it'd be dear Governor Abbott, okay? Then the body, this is where you would develop your ideas, the reason you're writing your letter. And so we have an intro, the body, and the closing. And we can have our students understand that no matter what, kind of writing they're going to do, one of the keys to their level of communication is how well have you developed fully your ideas. So of these components, the body is very important. But if the student is speaking from their experience, no one can say, well, what you've written is not okay, or it's not correct. It's their concern. It's their thank you. It's their opinion. So this validates that their ideas, their emotions, their responses and reactions to what's going on in their life has someone that will read it, and they care about what's in the letter. So from date all the way down to signature, and knowing that in the old days, and I do talk about that in these webinars, uh, we would have students write letters, and sometimes they would wanna write, dear principal. Well, I always made sure that if they wrote a letter to the principal, the principal got the honor of reading that letter. Some of them did not make much impact, but some of them had very deliberate ideas of a middle school student, and the principal would say, thank you, Mr. Sharp, for bringing these letters, so that the student knows actions or reactions, responses could happen. And that's when we look at what are the components where are we moving into? How is it going to be developed? And making sure if they want to be persuasive, they've got some very persuasive reasons within their body. So Jeannie, is there anything else you'd like to add on the components? Uh, no, I think you've done a good job. The thing that I would just encourage teachers, um, and prob this probably is not a concern for elementary teachers, but when we talk about the language, we, we don't want students to use profanity. No, 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 but it's not gonna get done. The yeah, in a very respectful manner, uh, because profanity is not gonna get a result other than perhaps being thrown in a, in a trash can. So we want students to be, to be serious about the issue that they are addressing and to address it pro professionally. I wanna say that sometimes students, um, because they yes, like to use a lot of informal language, but yeah. even me as a professor, they uh, some of my students, master levels, will say, hey, hey, hey. No. and it's like, what? When I, whenever I receive that, it's like, uh, I can't believe that sometimes students do that. It's not hey, but uh, 
dear Dr. Aviles. Dr. Or, Aviles. <laughs> Miss Aviles, you know, I, even a miss, but not hey. To me, hey is for a friend, you know, and sometimes they confuse that. They're not aware that you have to keep that in mind. Hay is for horses. Hay is for horses, we realize. That, that's exactly right. Neil has also brought one of those changing attitudes toward. That sounds to me like the student at whatever level in college is responding as if they were sending a text. Text is much more informal, and the students need to know from the very beginning of a letter you got to be careful with the language that you use and how you address a public official. And I would think that even in college, it would show that student has probably not written very many letters. And if they had, they would know it's a bit more formal than a text message. Correct. Yeah. Thank you for that addition. That's very good. Uh, this slide looks at our ELAR TEKS. We are delighted that we have at least one participant from out of state. So we want to make sure that everyone understands that we're looking at Texas standards and ELAR is English Language uh, Arts and Reading TEKS. So when we're looking at strand six, which has to do with composition, we have two knowledge and skill statements. The first is the student uses the writing process recursively to compose multiple texts. Okay, so that's, that's the writing process. And the expectation is from kindergarten to 12 is that the student is expected to plan by generating ideas for writing, developing drafts, organizing ideas, revising, editing, publishing, uh, everything. Uh, again, K-12. The second knowledge and skill statement is the student uses genre characteristics and craft to compose multiple texts that are meaningful. And here you can see by grade level what the expectation is. And in first grade, students are dictating or co uh, composing correspondence such as thank you notes and letters. Second and third grade, continuing. Uh, they're not dictating, however. They're composing correspondence, thank you notes or letters. Fourth and fifth grade, they're looking at composing correspondence that, that requests information. Sixth through eighth grade, it becomes even more formal, more, um, more students have more of a, a voice in the larger community. Uh, correspondence that it reflects an opinion, registers a complaint or requests information. And then finally, grades nine through 12 or English one through four, students are expected to compose cor correspondence in a professional or friendly structure. You can see how the student expectations are aligned by grade level. That's the wonderful thing about this strand, and in fact, all of the other strands in our TEKS. There's a, ver a vertical alignment from kinder to 12 uh, in English language arts and, and reading. Jeannie, on this, if I could add that yeah. I had mentioned this earlier about the uh, way that it gets more mature in the writing expected, but what it would also say, looking at this and from what we've just been discussing, that once this is going well statewide, there shouldn't be students starting a note to their professor saying, hey, <laughs> if they're truly following the teaks in their classrooms, then it's showing that you're going to use professional and it could be friendly if it's a friendly letter, but you're certainly not going to be using the same kind of language you would talk to a friend. But from dictation through composing thank yous to then requesting information to then giving a correspondence reflecting upon and then writing with that professional structure. Uh, it may be that some of our students have not had enough letter writing. <laughs> well, per, and they perhaps have not re ever received a letter. That could be If, not, if you've they not say, received a letter. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's true. Yeah. I, I do want to add that, if I may, that uh, we also, when we write letters, like, we, like you, you guys model, uh, it's, it's, it's some type of persuasive um, 
you know, approach, right? And not only are you advocating for yourself, like um, Gerald and, and Jeannie did, but you're also advocating for others, you know, mm -hmm. which sometimes uh, it's important. And then when you write letters, also you expect a response to that letter, uh, which is, um, I remember in the past, like, like you said, we wrote a letter by hand, we mm -hmm. put it in the mail, yeah. and, we were, and we were just uh, ecstatic about uh, waiting and counting the days when that letter was gonna reach that person and then expecting them to immediately respond. And then when it would pass too much time, it's like, I wonder why they're not responding. And yeah. sometimes uh, back in the day when we have also phones and we can call them and say, send you a letter, are you okay? So there's a lot of other uh, responses, not only just with the letter writing, but also the response. And if it's something that is related to, like for a medical doctor, I remember I had, I had to write a persuasive letter to a, to a medical um, committee so that they would approve a surgery, a surgery that I needed to have out of state and for the, my insurance to be able to cover all those expenses. So I had to really write down and, and, and think about my thoughts and how I could uh, uh, touch their heart so that they could make a decision that was in my favor. So all those things are, are, are so important. Definitely. 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 Thank you. That's another good addition. Thank you. Thank you. We talked about how the first knowledge and skill statement in the ELARTICS has to do with the writing process. So here we have the steps in, in the writing process. Uh, for pre-writing, uh, students are going to retrieve topics from their journal entries. Okay, they've, they've written in their journals and they're going to go back, reflect on their entries and see which one that they feel strongly about. We know that when kids feel strongly about a topic or a prompt, they write more and they write better. Okay, they'll become more engaged in that topic. Drafting has to do with writing, organizing ideas and actually getting the, uh, the, the sentences, the paragraphs, uh, written and uh, ready to be uh, perhaps read up to a family member for feedback uh, or it could be um, a family member could could offer suggestions um, for children who are very young or who have special needs and can't uh, compose or can't write themselves they could dictate okay dictating uh, dictating a letter to someone is is certainly appropriate. When we come to revising, we talk about a whole lot of revising strategies and the on dist online distance learning may prohibit the uh, instruction of some of those strategies. If we were in classrooms face-to-face -face with students, there'd be much more opportunity for specific strategies. But we know that revising has to do with either adding information, deleting information, or moving information around. So hopefully someone at home or a sibling could hear the student's uh, letter and make some comments about the, the content. With revising, we're talking content. When we talk about editing, we're talking about mechanics and grammar. Um, and we, we, of course, are only going to hold students responsible for what they've been taught. Um, as a teacher, we could provide a checklist that might list some of the mechanical aspects that we think the student should have uh, included or uh, should have mastered, maybe capitalization of proper nouns, maybe comma after the uh, salutation and the closing. Uh, some of those points that are going are gonna to polish the paper or polish the letter. We don't want a letter being sent that is, that is full of errors that takes away from the effectiveness of the letter, okay, from the, the professional uh, aspect of the letter, okay. For our letters to be taken seriously, they have to be, they have to be uh, very well edited, okay, very neatly written. Uh, and then publishing. The teacher could encourage students to go ahead and um, send their letters to the the official on the uh that they're that they're writing to okay 
uh, they may or may not, and I guess we need to tell students ahead of time, they may or not may not get a response because this is a busy time for everybody right now. We, we feel sure, we're pretty certain that the students, would, their letters would be, would be read by the, the person to whom they're sending it, uh, but they may or may not get a response. But nevertheless, they could send that letter off to a, uh, to a, a public official with the, with the hopes that their, their writing would be read and then addressed. If I could add anything, Joe? Yes. When, when we look at revision on other writings the students and the student writers do, uh, revising here, when we talked about a more formal language, uh, a business-like language, that is where I would hope that the letter writer could read the letter and other students could be saying, oh, I think you need to not use slang or whatever. And, and in the editing, definitely reinforcing what Jenny had said, you don't want to send off letters that do have errors. So this time the students would see, oh, because of this genre, because of writing a letter to a public official, we definitely need to have more chances to make it a better letter so that's how it goes yeah exactly exactly on the next slide we have a list of books in fact there are 12 books that can serve as mentor texts for ideas for grammar and mechanics or for author's craft these are only a few of the many titles out there that would be helpful when it comes to to talking to students uh, about letter writing and to, to showing students examples of letter. So we'll begin by briefly discussing each of these titles, okay? And the titles vary by, um, although we believe that a picture book can be used with any grade level, some of them might be more appropriate for a primary student versus perhaps an intermediate student. So the first one is, Can I Be Your Dog? And this book is written from the perspective of a dog, and he wants to be adopted. And he tells his story through a series of letters, okay? It is humorous, and it is heartfelt. The second is Click, Clack, Moo, Cows the Type. And uh, in this hilarious story, Fa Farmer Brown has a problem. His cows type letters to him requesting various items. He responds through letters and soon other barnyard animals make requests and a whole lot of adventures ensue. Now, when I've used this book with, with children, it's interesting, again, talking about showing our age, the title is Cows That Type, so you actually see a typewriter in the book. <laughs> children don't know what a typewriter is anymore. They know a computer, they know a, a laptop, they know a, a tablet. A keyboard, yeah. Yeah, a keyboard, but not a type uh, typewriter so you certainly want to show the picture of the typewriter uh, the following title the day the crayons quit is a relatively new title and uh, in this the individual colors of the crayons write to a young boy duncan explaining why they either feel overused or underrepresented in his drawings but by the, and they all have legitimate reasons. They provide evidence as to how or why they are being slighted in their, in their use when Duncan draws. But at the end of the book, Duncan comes up with a way to use all the crayons equally, and everybody is happy. Dear Mr. Blueberry is an older title, too. Uh, it's available in Spanish, Querido Salvatierra. And in this book, it's a... Um, a, uh, a dialogue, it's a, a, an exchange of letters between Emily, a young student, and her teacher, Mr. Blueberry. So during the summer, she and he carry on a correspondence, and she asks for information on whales, and he provides that information, and they have a, they develop a, uh, a kind of an imaginative, a creative, but a, a very heartwarming relationship. Uh, Dear Mrs. LaRue, Letters from Obedience School, actually uh, has a sequel, one or two sequels, and 
the series is hilarious. It's a picture book. And in this book, Ike is a misbehaving dog. And because of that, he's sent to Brotweiler Canine Academy, which he sees as a prison. Through a series of letters, he begs his owner, Mrs. LaRue, to rescue him. Ike finally escapes and finds himself as a hero after an unusual adventure. Young children would enjoy this, but the humor is especially entertaining for kids who are a little bit older. I Wanna Iguana uh, is a book where a young boy, Alex, wants an iguana for a pet. And he and his mother exchange a series of letters giving reasons why he should or shouldn't have an iguana for a pet. Old Henry is another delightful title. It's been around for a while too. And in this book, uh, Henry moves into, is a gentleman moves into a neighborhood, into a house that's kind of run down. Uh, the neighbors are happy that someone has moved in because they figure that the house is gonna be kept up. Well, on the contrary, Henry doesn't mow the grass, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, shovel the snow, and the neighbors are unhappy about this. Henry finally moves, but after he moves, the house is lonely again, and the neighbors realize that they miss him. So Henry misses the neighbors, he writes a letter to the mayor asking to come back, okay? A real cute story. Um, a letter to my teacher is, uh, is somewhat autobiographical. The narrator writes a letter to her second grade teacher to thank her for supporting her and understanding her when she was in her class and having some difficulties. Mango Moon, also available in Spanish, La Luna Mango, uh, talks about a little girl, Maricela, whose father is deported. And to keep in contact with him, she and he exchange notes or exchange letters. Um, the, it shows the love that is maintained between the two because of that exchange of letters. Uh, the next book, Sincerely Yours, Writing Your Own Letter, is a little bit of a how-to. This book, it's, it's a little paperback, offers tips and tools to familiarize children with writing thank you notes, get well cards, and business letters. And then I'm gonna skip City Secret, CD Secrets and go to Yours Truly Goldilocks by Alma Florada. And again, this book is available in Spanish, Atentamente Risitos de Oro. Um, in this book, fairy tale characters become pen pals when planning a housewarming party for the three little pigs. And then this would be a cute, uh, activity to be done when children are reading fairy tales. And our Texas Teaks have children reading fairy tales in kindergarten through third grade. So it's a good partner activity there. Okay, I'll turn it over to Gerald. Show and tell, City Secrets, S-I-T-T-I, -T -T -I, is an Arabic word for grandmother. This is by San Antonio's own institution, Naomi Shehab Nye, who her father was Palestinian. And in the introduction and the dedication of the book, she dedicated it to her own Siti back on the West Bank, and who at that time in 1994 was 105 years old. So this girl on the front is Mona in the book. Mona goes to see her grandmother, and she sees how peaceful it is, how much her grandmother loves life and all around her, things that grow. And when she gets back to the United States from her travels, she writes a letter to the president. And it's something I used with eighth graders because back in the 90s, they had to write some persuasive letters for state testing. And I gave them this letter, reading the whole book to them. So by the letter, you really care about, Mr. President, you need to know my grandmother. She has this lemon tree and she, but never does she say we should do something. However, it's a most effective sort of letter 
and communication with calls for peace and some sort of settlement of the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And so it's a beautiful book. And if you could ever get the hard cover with the uh, beautiful book cover itself, the art within it is absolutely just exquisite. And the story is warm and it definitely shows to real middle school students the importance of working in that persuasion and try to give it without saying, and I say you ought to do it. Well, we're not going to have to be that exact in our request. And the last one on there, I've seen in middle school anthologies, and it's Letter from Birmingham Jail from Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, this shows the importance of writing a communication that deals with huge issues of inequality and injustice and if one suffers then all are suffering and that kind of response from that letter was so pivotal in our civil rights movements and so letters can be very persuasive and call people to action Next slide. Topics for each of our three webinars, we've given some additional topics. If the student is not really getting into, uh, I don't know how to write a letter to the mayor, to the county judge, to the governor, uh, how about the stay at home orders? Many middle school teenage students really don't like being forced to stay at home. Wearing a face mask, the social distancing, which our governor says is not that important right now, and he's got someone in Washington who seems to agree. So we're looking at how are we gonna keep that political distancing, but it did exist, and the students may have strong opinions about it. The closing of parks, movie theaters, restaurants, Obviously, there's changes happening there as we read this list. <laughs> then we look at not allowing relatives in hospitals. If the students had some family member hospitalized, they were not able to go and visit. And even if that person was near death, they were not allowed to go visit. So that can make a definite impact stopping the visits to nursing homes. That is a very emotional subject, especially to a spouse who has a loved one on the other side of the window. And then the lack of availability of testing that may sound more technical, but the students may say, yeah, we ought to have the ability to get enough tests. That could be the purpose for a letter. Next slide. Jeannie. When we look at teacher expectations, we're looking at expectations that you might be able to uh, talk to the students about through, through your video uh, taping, okay, videotaping yourself. Direct instruction, guiding students through an unfamiliar genre. Uh, you may need to create an anchor chart with a large copy of the uh, letter for students to re refer to. Students, again, as we said earlier, may not have experience with receiving letters, so we want to make sure that they, that they understand what the format is. Uh, kids need to see us writing. Just like when Gerald gave the invitation to write earlier, uh, we all wrote. Gerald wrote, I wrote, all of us wrote. Uh, Students will be more likely to imitate our behavior, our writing behavior, if they see us modeling. Uh, writing, any kind of writing, is not an easy undertaking. As part of our modeling, we need to do uh, think alouds so the students can not only see but also understand our, our, our expectations. 
we may need to think aloud to try to decide which idea or which concern, which issue we'll respond to, what we see as the problem, what the solution might be. Students may need to see us crossing out or starting over and hear us explain why we did that. It's okay to start over, it's okay to cross out. Most importantly, we need to remember that teaching is, uh, telling is not teaching. Students need to see and hear what we want them to do and how to achieve it. Because it's a personal issue, we want students to write in the first person. Okay, they are personally and honestly responding to an occurrence or event for which they have a strong feeling. Each student's feelings and reactions will be different. And we'd want them to use words like I, me, my. We want students to build up their confidence in writing. We know that students write best and write the most about something they've experienced and something they care about. You may want to give a grade for, an eval for completion or a grade for the degree of support that the student has provided. You may create a basic rubric to evaluate certain aspects of the writing, especially if you have modeled them for the students. Or you could create a checklist where students can self-evaluate. We want the students to uh, have the opportunity to share what they've written uh, for feedback before they would send it out, uh, maybe with a family member. Or they could share it if they are sharing online with a, a small group or a buddy. With so many uncertainties in the world today, it may bring comfort to a student that someone else is concerned about the same issues that he or she is concerned about. Gerald? Next slide, please. On this one, when we look at going public, uh, we would love to see them mailing a letter. That may or may not happen, but if it's a young child, dictating to a family member that could be in place of the teacher especially if school is not open the online messaging i i would be careful there because if it's an instant message i think that's a little too informal and then when we are communicating with email to a public official if it's a local official that might be sufficient and you often have in the media all of those addresses for emails to be getting to somebody so we've got various options there we do allow for those learners who have varying styles or preferences of learning but we want that communication to get to that official next slide jimmy our final slide looks at professional resources. And one of the prime resources for our presentation was a book by Dr. Joyce Armstrong Carroll and Edward Wilson called Acts of Teaching. Gerald's holding it right now, How to Teach Writing. And he's having, he's having, having to show the third edition. Uh, there also is a, a great article for elementary teachers, probably more than secondary teachers, an introduction to letter writing. And you have the website there. It's under the Reading Rockets uh, uh, site, website. Then there are some um, professional organizations that are doing especially well with uh, discussing the pandemic from the, from the point of view of a teacher, offering suggestions, to help the teacher, offering suggestions to empower students. So here you see the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development, their Smart, Smart Briefs, the National Council of Teachers of English, the Smart Briefs, um, British Broadcasting uh, Corp Corporation, uh, America, New York Times. The New York Times is um, asking for submissions from teenagers and they're publishing those submissions, and they're all having to do about living through a pandemic. Uh, and the current topic that they're looking at is how is the coronavirus affecting your life? And they are getting student, and they're publishing these, and they're getting student responses from all over the world, not just the United States. And it's interesting to see what students across the world are thinking and feeling at this time. National Public Radio and Texas Public Radio also are attuned 
to teacher needs and student needs. We could add a PBS public uh, broadcasting system. There are several PBS stations across the United States that are offering opportunities for elementary students to send in their, uh, their responses and their reflections. There is ample uh, opportunity for students. And check those online addresses, check those websites. They are there for yeah. the asking. Uh, or questions, we, we thank you for participating, but we also want to give you time to, uh, to ask a question or to share a thought or concern or something you would like to add, perhaps something you've already done with your students. So if you'd like to check that, to submit something, uh, respond if you want to raise your hand or put something in the chat box, we'll be sure to, uh, to, uh, to recognize you. You know, while, while they're thinking of their comments, I'll add something, Jeannie. I thought that was really interesting that you brought up the fact that students, the majority of them haven't received any kind of correspondence through the post. Right. Um, I, I think that would be a really cool activity, especially right now that everybody's at home for, um, for, 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 for teachers, educators, friends, parents, whatever have you, to encourage students to write a letter to one of their friends and physically put that in the mailbox. And yes, so that the friend can receive it. I think that's a, a really neat idea. And it's an, uh, I think that's a neat way for the students to get excited about writing uh, yeah. to their friends and, and, just learn, and, and just to feel what it's like to receive a letter. I mean, Revive that's something. It. Yeah, you know, I mean, as adults, we know that the mail is mostly filled with bills and junk. <laughs> and so, so, you know, I mean, you, you miss those times when you would receive letters in the mail and there was something from a friend. Um, and again, I don't think uh, kids, um, you know, the students uh, of today um, can recognize, they don't have that uh, set of experiences. They don't know what it feels like. So that, that could be a really cool activity. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to share, I want to share that uh, when I was a teacher, I actually had a, a bat unit and my students created books for the little kids in elementary. And then I send the books uh, to the different classrooms and each of the kids received a book from one of my students. And then what the teacher did, once the kids uh, read the books that they received from my students, each student wrote a, a letter to that particular student who, who uh, had the, the book uh, writing for them, right? So, mm -hmm. and, and when those letters were given to me and I distributed them to my seventh graders, you should have seen the, the joy. And yes. they were reading those letters and they were like, yes, Look what mine yeah. said, and then look at what mine said, and they were all excited, and they, it was a great experience. I, I, to this day, I still remember some of those little faces uh, of the joy and the impact of the, the letter that the seventh graders received. And, and I also imagine the, the, the faces of the little ones when they got those books and they got to see what the drawings that they made and, and what they learned about bats, because there's a lot of myths about them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think back to when I was teaching elementary, again, decades ago, I would, before the school year started, a few days before school started, I would send a letter to each student, uh, wow. introducing myself and talking about the year, and talk about building relationships. I mean, the kids came in, many of them with letter in hand, so thrilled that they'd received a letter, and it just started the, sc the school year off wonderfully for all of us. Excellent. Anyone else has a comment or any questions from the audience? Janice, it was wonderful having you with us today and last week. <laughs> we wish you the best. We can't hear you, Janice. But because she was following directions and <laughs> muted her mic. <laughs> I enjoyed it too. Thank you. I learned a lot. Good. Good. Wonderful. Anyone else? So let's then bring it to the closure. I thank you so much for your time and for all the learnings that we experienced today. I thank you, uh, Mr. Sharp and Ms. Gantu and Michelle, also for helping us and for the valuable information that was shared. I, I love the research that you have done, the examples of the books. The, and the resources that you provided uh, throughout. Our time is up, but if any of you would like information or support about anything of the, uh, any, any 
uh, important aspect in the writing and how we can impact student learning, please feel free to reach us at idra.org or to my email address, milka, N-I-L-K-A dot Aviles at idra.org. Please look up us all at uh, on Idra's YouTube channel so that you can see uh, other webinars and other valuable information that we have on our website. Again, thank you so much. Be well and hope to see you all soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.